Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to our live session today. Today, we will begin our second phase of this course, which is, of course, going to be the intermediate English grammar. Sorry, not the intermediate, the secondary English grammar. Up to yesterday, we finished uh, our primary English grammar. And from today onward, uh, and for the next two days, we will be covering the second phase of this particular course, and the second phase being known as secondary English grammar. Okay? And the very first chapter of this new phase is the subject and verb agreement. So we will head straight and see what we have to, uh, for today. The subject and verb agreement. What exactly is the subject and verb agreement? Or how do a subject and a verb agree? In a sentence, a verb must agree with its corresponding subject. The verb specifically agrees with the subject's number. Consider the following examples. My father is a doctor. My parents are very kind. Golden rule. A singular subject needs a singular verb. And a plural subject needs a plural verb. Right? So... In English language, if we ever consider a chapter that is, it can be considered uh, as the most important chapter, or, all right, let's just say one of the most important chapters, if not the only most important chapter, then the subject verb agreement has to be it. It's because uh, if you don't have a working understanding of the subject or of this particular chapter, then your grammar will never be okay, will never be proper enough, because the subject verb agreement literally directs or leads uh, our understanding of English grammar. So it is of utmost importance that you pay your attention, that you, that you pay your utmost attention uh, to today's lesson. Okay? All right. So... I'm going to go through this slide once again. So how do a subject and a verb agree in a sentence or in any sentence, a verb must agree with its corresponding subject. So the subject of the sentence and the verb of the sentence must agree with each other. And in what regard, in what regard do they specifically agree? They agree with each other in number, right? So for example, if the subject is singular, then the verb must be singular as well. If the subject is plural, uh, the verb must be plural as well. Now, this goes most of the time for the present tense, right? Or such as, for example, if your sentence is in the present tense, then, of course, the verb will, will uh, either be in the singular form or the plural form because here, if your sentence is in the past tense form, then the verb... Then, then the number of the verb really doesn't matter. That's because, such as, for example, if I say, he makes cakes, follow this, he makes cakes, right? So here, this particular sentence is in the simple present tense, and it is talking about something that is uh, that, that, that happens every now and then. We're talking about a person who may be professionally, who, who perhaps professionally makes cakes, right? So we say he makes cakes. But since we have a singular subject here, the verb uh, uh, accordingly is singular, which is makes. But if we were to say she and he, here we would have two people. And then, then in that case, we would have to say she and he make cake, not makes. So the verb will then be in its plural form. She and he make cake, cakes. However, if we, if we were to change the tone of this or the tense of the sentence to the past tense, then we would have to say, uh, he made cakes or he made a cake or she and he made a cake. You see, in the past tense form or in the past tense, the verb, the, uh, the, the form of the verb doesn't change, right? Because the verb form is going to be in the past tense and it doesn't matter if the subject is singular or plural. Because uh, for both cases, the verb remains the same. He made a cake. She and he together made a cake. The verb made remains the same for both the cases. But however, if the tense 
of the sentence is to be uh, in the present tense. If the tense is, uh, if the tense of the sentence is to be uh, the present tense, then of course the verb has to agree with the subject uh, in number. So if we say he, it's just one subject, one a singular subject, and the verb must be singular, being he makes cakes. But if we were to say he and she, then we would say he and she make cakes. Okay. All right. However, we will be diving deeper into all this, but for now, we must take very uh, we must take a very good look at this uh, golden rule we have here, which is a singular subject needs a singular verb, and a plural subject needs a plural verb. That's the golden rule for present tense sentences. Okay, for sentences that are in the present tense, a singular subject requires a singular verb, and a plural subject requires a plural verb. All right. I'm going to take into I'm going to group back some of your greetings. I'm, I'm going to greet back to some of you who have greeted me here. Ninza Muni says, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Salahuddin Rana says, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Maliha Afrin says, Assalamu alaikum, haya. Wa alaikum assalam. Tasni Arabi says, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Okay, Maliha Afrin has another question here. She's asking, when will the automatics recruiting? Okay, uh, well, this is, this, 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 the, the, the more uh, proper person to actually answer this question, if you us, would be our HR. So we do host recruitment sessions or online uh, career info session every week. I think uh, you can be asking this question in one of those, during one of those sessions. You, in that case, uh, you, you, will, you will most likely get the most uh, perfect answer. Okay. All right. Anyway, thanks again for greeting me and for being here with me today. Now let's move forward. Determining the subject. So before we go and decide which verb to make agree with the subject, we first need to identify which is the subject in a sentence, right? Because if you don't know which is the subject in your sentence, you wouldn't know uh, how to make your verb agree with with the subject if you don't know what the sub or which or what or which the subject is, right? So many a time we come across a noun phrase. Many a time we come across a noun phrase and it becomes a little tricky to find out the head word in the phrase that must be agreed with by the verb. Consider the following examples. A bouquet of red roses make my wife happy. A bouquet of red roses make my wife happy. Now, if I were to tell you or if I were to ask you which is the head word or the main subject here in the, in the subject phrase, a bouquet of red roses, it may be a little difficult for you if you're not an expert at it, right? So just for example, it may appear to you that the subject uh, is red roses, right? It, it just may appear to you like that. Or you could say the subject is bouquet or a bouquet. So you cannot be, you may not be completely sure. So you need to be sure in order to make your verb agree with your subject. So which is the main uh, subject or which is the head word in this particular noun phrase or subject phrase here. The head word is of course the word bouquet. So we are talking about one bouquet here. Therefore the subject is singular and the verb must be singular as well. So a bouquet of red roses makes my wife ha happy. <clears throat> Let's read what we have here in the last paragraph on this slide. The verb makes must agree with the number of the head word in the subject phrase. The verb makes must agree with the number of the head word in the subject phrase, a bouquet of red roses. The head word is not roses, so don't fall for it. Just because the word roses is right before the verb make or makes, don't think that roses is the subject and that the verb make must agree with it. But bouquet, which is singular, since we are talking about, about a bouquet or one bouquet, hence the verb must be in its singular form as well. Therefore, since the, since the head word uh, in the subject phrase or in the noun phrase is the word bouquet, and the word bouquet being a singular word, a singular noun or a singular subject, the verb following must be singular as well, which is why we say a bouquet of red roses makes my wife happy. Also note, when you want to keep a verb in its singular form, most of the time what we do is we add an S to that verb to show its singularity, to express its singularity. 
So we say he loves, she likes, uh, I, or it's, uh, John hates, my wife makes, right? So you see in each of these cases, the verb is singular because of the subject, which is also singular. And to express the singularity of the verb, we are adding an S to each of the verbs, okay? So since here in this word, a bouquet of red roses makes my wife happy, the word or the subject is singular, which is a bouquet. The verb following is also uh, singular, which is makes. So a bouquet of red roses makes my wife happy. Again, note this word or this entire sentence is in the present tense. It's in the simple present tense. Something that happens or something that is uh, quite natural, something that, that happens uh, time and again. So a bouquet of red roses makes my wife happy. That's more like a universal truth. Okay, a common truth. So common truths are always uh, spoken of in the simple present tense. So a bouquet of red roses makes my wife happy. Uh, the head word in the phrase is the word a bouquet, right? I hope we are clear. Moving on to the next slide. Now, how do we treat this? Or, neither nor, or either or. If two singular subjects or connect, uh, sorry, if two singular subjects are connected by or, or either or, or neither nor, then the verb following must be singular in form. Follow this. I'll repeat this again. If two if, if two singular subjects are connected by or, or either or, or neither nor, then the verb following must be singular in form, right? Do you follow? So when you're joining two singular nouns or pronouns, when you're joining two singular nouns or pronouns with or, or neither nor, or either or, then the verb following must be singular must be singular, given, of course, the sentence is in the simple present tense. Consider the following examples. My cousin or my uncle is arriving by train today. So here, it's not, you're not talking about both your cousin and your uncle coming by train today. Not both of them are doing so. Either of them, only one of them, only one of the two is arriving by train today. So the subject is definitely singular, right? So there is an alternative, there is a choice, either this or that. So either my cousin or my cousin or my uncle is arriving by train today. Since the subject is singular, the connotation, uh, the expression is singular, the verb following must be singular as well. So my cousin or my uncle is arriving by train today. Neither Jack nor Jill is present to entertain the guests today. Neither Jack nor Jill is present to entertain the guests today. So none of the people here, Jack or Jill, none of the two is actually present to entertain the guests today. All right. Neither of, neither of the two is present to entertain the guests today. Either my father or my mother is financing the decorations. Either my father or my mother is financing the decorations. Now, in each of these examples, the verb is singular. Why? Because the subject is singular. Although you have two mentions or two nouns, but the nouns are joined or connected with or by or, or neither nor, or either or, meaning either of the two, not two together, but any one of the two. Therefore, the meaning or the expression is singular. The noun is singular or the subject is singular. Therefore, the verb is singular as well. Okay? All right. Moving forward to the next slide. The verb in, all right, I'll read this again for you. The verb in an or, or either or, or neither nor sentence agrees with the noun or pronoun closest to it. Now, pay extra attention to this slide now. In the last slide, we learned that when or, or neither nor, or either or, joins two singular nouns, not two plural or one singular or one plural. When they join two singular nouns, the verb is also singular. The verb also remains singular, right? 
But here, in this case, the verb agrees with the number of the noun or pronoun closest to it in a sentence where you have two nouns and both the nouns are connected by or, or either or, or neither nor. Let's take a look at the examples. My sisters or my brother is going to pay for dinner tonight. My sisters or my brother is going to pay for dinner tonight. My brother or my sisters are going to pay for dinner tonight. Either my father or my uncles decide what to do with the business. Either my uncles or my father decides what to do with the business. Neither my sons nor my daughter wants to study medicine. Neither my daughter nor my sons want to study medicine. Now what's happening here? Note that in the very first example, my sisters or my brother, right? So either of the two, either it's going to be my sisters or my brother. Now sisters is of course plural, but brother is singular. So the verb is, is closest to the noun brother, which is singular in this case. Therefore the verb is singular as well. So my sisters or my brother is going to pay for dinner tonight, not are. But in the very next example, we have my brother or my sisters are going to pay for my uh, are, are going to pay for dinner tonight. Here, uh, the 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 subject phrase has been reversed, and sisters is now put closer to the verb are. Therefore, the verb must follow the noun or the pronoun that is closest to it. So here, the closest uh, pronoun, sorry, the closest noun uh, is sisters, which is plural. Therefore, the verb is also plural. So we say, my brother or my sisters are going to pay for dinner tonight. The similar, and it's the same case for the other two situations as well, such as either my father or my uncles decide. Now, decide is a plural verb in this case. Either my father or my uncles decide what to do with the business, or either my uncles or my father decides what to do with the business. Since my father is singular, the verb is also kept singular by adding an S to the verb, which is decides. But if we were to keep it plural, then we would say decide. And we would only do so when the, when the, subject, uh, when the, sub, when the subject, the verb is following, is plural, which uh, in this case would be my uncles. So either my father or my uncles decide what to do with the business. Either my uncles or my father decides what to do with the business. Okay, now let's take a look at the third case here. Neither my sons nor my daughter, neither my sons nor my daughter wants to study medicine here. You have maybe two sons or three sons, whatever the number, your sons are plural. Uh, you don't have only one son, but more than one son. So you say neither my sons nor my daughter, but in your daughter's case, uh, you're keeping it singular, meaning that you have only one daughter. So neither my sons nor my daughter want to study medicine. In this case, the word wants, uh, the verb wants is being kept in the singular form because it's following a, set, uh, a subject, which is singular, which is daughter in this case. So neither my sons nor my daughter wants to study medicine. But in the very next example, the subject has been, the subject phrase is reversed and we have neither my daughter or my sons want to study medicine. Since the subject sons is plural, the verb following is also plural, which is want. Neither my daughter nor my sons want to study medicine. All right, uh, we've got some questions here. Let's see if, uh, if I can answer these questions. My team or coach are present here. Is the sentence correct, sir? No, it's not. It's because I think you've misspelled the word coach. Uh, but here, if you're going to talk about your coach, you mean only one coach, right? So if you have one coach, then of course the subject is singular and the verb following must also be singular, which, which is why this, this sentence uh, would rather be my team or our coach is present here, not are present here. But if, we, if you were to rearrange it and say uh, the coach or the team, and if you consider team as a plural collective noun, then you could say, uh, the t uh, my coach or the team are present here. Okay, but in most cases, we consider collective nouns as singular. So for both cases, uh, sorry, sorry. So in either way, we would actually put the, in either ways, we would actually put the verb 
uh, singular. We, we would keep the verb singular. So we would say my team or coach is present here or my coach or our coach or our team is present here. Okay? All right. So Laudin Rana has a question. He asked me whether either of the applicants was aware suitable. Which one is correct? All right. So in this case, we would go with either of the applicants was. Because when you add the word either, you actually talk about both of something in their individual uh, uh, sense. So we say either neither of the teams was able to score a goal. We say neither or neither of the teams was able to score a goal, not were, not were. We don't say neither of the teams were able to score a goal. We, we rather say neither of the teams was able to score a goal. So similarly, in this case as well, we should be saying, he asked me whether either of the applicants was suitable, not were. He asked me whether either of the applicants was suitable. Okay. All right. I hope your query is answered. Moving forward to the next question. The next slide, what do we have here? The subject and verb agreement. We use a plural verb with a plural subject or two or more subjects connected by and. Let's pay attention to this. When we have two or more subjects, when we have two or more subjects connected by and, the verb following must be plural. Why? Because of course you have plural subjects. Having more than one subject is of course plural subject. Therefore, the verb following must be plural as well. On the other hand, if you have a plural subject directly, then definitely that plural subject must be must be followed by a plural verb. Consider the examples given. My grandparents are coming over this weekend. My grandparents are coming over this weekend. Both my car and my motorcycle are in the garage for repairing. Both my car and my motorcycle are in the garage for repairing. Mother and father are not at home now. Mother and father are not at home now. In each of these cases, note that the subjects, the subject is plural. And uh, in the second and the third example, we have more than one subject. Therefore, the subjects are connected by and, which is why forming a plural subject followed by a plural verb. So both my car, one subject, adding more to it, we have a motorcycle, my motorcycle. So both my car and my motorcycle. Now you have a plural subject phrase. So both my car and my motorcycle are in the garage for repairing. The verb must be plural as well because you have a plural subject phrase. So both my car and my motorcycle are in the garage for repairing. Mother and father, you're talking about both, you're talking about your parents here. So the word parents is plural, but if you if you want to break it down to mother and father, that's also fine. If you if you do so, uh, the verb following must also be plural because you're talking about two people here. So mother and father are not at home. But if you were to say only about your father, then you would have to say father is not at home. Or if you wanted to talk about your mother, you would say uh, you would have to say mother is not at home. But if you uh, talking about both of them together, you say mother and father are not at home or parents, my parents are not at home right now. Exceptions. Take a look at these ex uh, exceptions here. Breaking and entering is against the law. Breaking and entering is against the law. The bed and breakfast was charming. The, bre the bed and breakfast was charming. So what's happening in these cases here as well, we can see we've got two subjects connected by and, yet the verb is singular. Why so? Breaking and entering and the bed and breakfast are compound nouns. Breaking and entering and the bed and breakfast are compound nouns, denoting a single idea, hence followed by singular verbs. So breaking and entering is actually not considered as a, uh, as, as a plural subject or is not considered as two separate acts, but rather considered as one unit of action, a singular, a single course of action. It's considered a singular course of action, a single course of action, which is why this is, uh, this is more like a compound noun and a singular compound noun, of course, followed by a singular verb. Breaking and entering is against the law. Just like we say bread and butter is not are. Uh, okay, bread and butter is cheap. 
or bread and butter is what I need. So just like bread and butter, we go with breaking and entering with, we, we follow bre uh, breaking and entering with uh, a singular verb. The bed and breakfast, the same case, this, uh, this, uh, the same case for the bed and breakfast as well. So the, the bed and breakfast was charming, not were charming. All right. Let's read what we have here. Sometimes the subject is separated from the verb by such words as along with, as well as besides, not, etc. These words and phrases are not part of the subject. Ignore them and use. These words and phrases are not part of the subject. Ignore them and use a singular verb when the subject is singular. Consider the following examples. The politician, along with the newsman, is expected shortly. Excitement as well as the nervousness is the cause of her is the cause of her shaking. So many a time we will come across certain subject phrases where we have the main subject immediately followed by another subordinate or a secondary subject, but that this particular secondary subject is rather connected to the main subject with phrases like as well as besides along with so do we take the secondary subject into consideration and consider the entire subject phrase as plural? No, we don't. So what do we do? We only focus on the main, the primary subject here, such as the politician. Take a look at the example here. The politician on with the newsman is expected shortly, not are expected shortly. Follow this. The politician along with the newsman is expected shortly, not are. So we're not really taking into consideration uh, the secondary subject here, the subordinate subject here, which is the newsman, right? Why, are, why aren't we taking this into consideration? It's because of the phrase, the connecting phrase, which is along with. So the phrase along with is connecting the secondary subject to the primary subject. And because of this, uh, because of this uh, connecting phrase, we are not taking into consideration the secondary subject here and not forming it or not treating the entire subject phrase as a plural subject phrase, but rather treating it as a singular subject phrase, uh, focusing only on the primary subject here, which is a politician. So the politician, along with the newsman, is expected shortly. Excitement, as well as nervousness, is the cause of her shaking. Here as well, the secondary subject, nervousness, is connected to the primary subject, excitement, with the help of the connecting phrase, as well as, right? Because we have this, we are not considering the entire subject phrase as plural, rather, but rather as singular. Okay? However, however, if we were not to consider, uh, if we were not to connect the subjects with the help of such connecting phrases as along with or as well as, and rather do it with and, then of course we would do it differently we would uh, rather treat both of them together. We would rather consider both and treat them as plural, followed by a plural verb, such as the politician and the newsman are expected shortly. The politician and the newsman are expected shortly. Or excitement and nervousness are the cause of her shaking. Excitement and nervousness are the causes of her shaking. You follow? Okay. Just because the connecting phrases here are different and not and, we are not treating them, we're not treating the secondary subjects, uh, we're not basically taking them into serious consideration to consider them, to make the entire phrase plural. You follow? Okay. Now we have an interesting question here. Mehdi Hassan Omi says, Mr. Salam, professor and the head of the discipline was delivering the speech. Of course was. It's because Mr. Salam is a professor and he is the same person who is the head of the discipline, right? You're not talking about two different people here. You're talking about one person here. However, your sentence is missing punctuation. 
uh, why and how so. Whenever you talk about a person's occupation or profession or you know, you come in with some more information about your subject, you need to separate that additional piece of information with commas. You need to set them off where set that particular additional information with commas. So Mr. Salam, comma, a professor and the head of the discipline, comma, was delivering the speech. Okay? Uh, since you're not talking about two people, but rather one, we go with was. Because the subject is singular, therefore the verb following must also be singular. Mr. Salam, professor and the head of the discipline, was delivering the speech. All right. All right, Saladin so Rana says, sir, I have another question about the comment section you haven't noticed yet. Is that so? All right, so you're asking here, what is the error of proximity in terms of agreement of verb with number and person? All right. It's it's basically the, 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 the very idea that uh, we discussed a little while ago where your verb agrees with the subject that is closest to it. When you have sentences with either or or neither nor, or, or when you have subject phrases with either or or nor, sometimes we, we become confused uh, regard to which subject should the verb agree with, right? Such so as, for example, if I say that the teacher, either the teacher or the students, blank at fault. Now, what do we put in the blank? Is or are? We are confused because we have a teacher and then we have the students. Now, the teacher is singular, but the students is plural. So, which verb uh, should we put here? Should the verb be a singular verb or should it be a plural verb? We put the verb according uh, we, we, uh, the verb that, that we're going to put must agree with the subject that is, that is the closest to it, that is closest to it. So in this case, if we say either the teacher or the students, so here the students, the, uh, the, the subject, the students, is of course cl closest uh, to, to the following verb here. So in this case, we would go with are. Either the, st either the teacher or the students are at fault. Okay, either the teacher or the students are at fault. And if we are to reverse it and say either the students or the teacher, then of course we would go with is. Either the students or the teacher is at fault. So this is basically the uh, error of proximity in this case. Okay? All right. Okay. I hope we are clear so far. Moving on to the next slide. A very simple rule here. Parentheses are not part of the subject. Parentheses are not part of the subject. So whenever you come up with some bracketed information right beside your subject, that bracketed piece of information must not be taken into consideration and the verb has nothing to do with it. So such as Joe and his trusty Matt was always welcome. So here, we will, we, we will never say were. We will never go and say Joe and his trusty Matt were always welcome. We would always rather say Joe and his trusty mutt was always welcome. Why? Because and his trusty mutt, this particular information is within parentheses, is within brackets. Now, you may be wondering what a mutt is. A mutt is actually a dog. So Joe and his trusty mutt was always welcome. However, if you were to lift the brackets and rather treat uh, the bracketed information as not bracketed information, but a part of the main sentence, then, then of course, uh, the verb would agree with the plural uh, subject phrase, which would be Joe and his trusty mutt were always welcome. Okay? All right. So, parentheses are not part of the subject. Any information you put within brackets right beside a subject is not to be taken into consideration by uh, the following verb. Okay. In sentences be beginning with here or there, the true subject follows the verb. This is interesting. Please pay attention to this. In the sentences beginning with here or there, the true subject follows the verb. So many a time we have sentences that begin with here or there, and we are confused whether to keep the verb uh, singular or plural, because we confuse, and, uh, we confuse ourselves and we cannot figure out which is the subject here. Is here or there a subject? No, of course not. Here or there is never. Here, here and there are never subjects. They're just basically adverbs, right? Or they're, yeah, they're, uh, they're demonstrative adverbs. So, uh, or adverbs of, adverbs of direction or adverbs of uh, indication. So, 
there are four hurdles to jump. So here the verb are is actually following the subject, the plural subject hurdles. There are four hurdles to jump. Now, if you're going to talk about only one hurdle, so you say there is a high hurdle to jump. Here are the keys. So uh, since you have plural keys or more than one key, so you say here are the keys. But if you were if you were to talk about only one key, you would say here is the key. So here and there is not to be uh, taken into consideration when you think of when you uh, judge which verb to put and which one to follow or how to make the verb and the subject agree. You only take you only you only see you find out what your subject is and according to that you put your verb. So for, for sentences like this, the subject comes later uh, or comes after the verb, unlike uh, other sentences. Okay, because in most sentences we have the subject coming first and then we have the verb. But in sentences like these, we have the verb coming first and then we have the subject. So there are four hurdles to jump or there is a high hurdle to jump or here are the keys. Okay, all right. I hope it's clear. Moving forward to the next slide. Use a singular verb with distances, periods of time, sums of money, etc. when considered as a unit. Now, units of distance, units of distance, units of time or periods of time or units of money are always considered singular no matter how big an amount are you you may be talking about. No matter how big an amount you may be talking about, that unit is always considered singular. Now, which units again? Units of time, units of uh, distance, units of money, some units of measurement as well. Okay? So, three miles is a unit of distance. Three miles is too far to walk. Three miles is too far to walk. Three miles is too far to walk. We never say three miles are. Because three miles is, of course, somehow plural, but then again, it, it denotes one unit of distance. So it is a singular. We always, we, we always treat such units as singular. So we say three miles is too far to walk. Five years is the maximum sentence for that offense. Five years is a unit of time. It's a period of time. And periods of time are always considered as singular individually. All right? So five years is the maximum sentence for that offense. Ten dollars is a high price to pay. Ten dollars is a high uh, is a high price to pay. Similarly, whenever you're talking about units of money, uh, whenever you talk about units of money, you 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 treat it you treat such a unit of money as uh, a singular item and follow it with a singular verb. Like in here, ten dollars is a high price to pay. Okay, I think I've got some questions there. Inzaloni says I'm not clear about there is and there are. It needs an easy example, sir. Okay. So I was saying that when you have sentences like these, there are or there is, you may be confused as to which subject should the verb agree with. Now, is here or there a subject? No. Here and there are never subjects. They're just uh indications or they're just adverbs of uh, directions there's there there's there's some there's some they're just directions they direct you right they indicate you or they demonstrate you so here and there these are not are, these are not your subjects the subjects in these cases come after your verb so you need to make your verb agree with the subject that follows later or that comes after so there are four hurdles to jump so since you have hurdles which is of course plural your verb in this case is to be plural as well which is there are four hurdles to jump but if you were talking about only one hurdle then you would say there is a, a high hurdle to jump or there is one hurdle to jump okay similarly if you were to go with one key you would say here is the key but since you're talking about more than one key uh, meaning you have uh, multiple keys, you say here are the keys. Okay? I hope you're clear. We have another question from Salah Rana. Knowledge and wisdom have 
of time, no connection. Excuse me? Knowledge and wisdom have of time, no connection. And honor and glory is its reward. Why are both different? I think you need to rephrase your sentence. Uh, I, need, I think you need to rephrase your sentences here because uh, I think uh, the sentences are not grammatically correct. However, although I'll try to see what you have tried to mean here. Knowledge and wisdom have of time no connection. And honor and glory is his reward. Why are both different? Okay. So in the first case, if you if you if you're meaning to ask why is uh, the set the subject phrase here being considered plural, right? Knowledge and wisdom. Of course, we can see that we have two subjects here: knowledge and wisdom, and the, and and the, both the subjects are connected by and. Therefore, it makes the subject phrase plural. Therefore, should be followed by a plural verb, which you have put here, which is have. So knowledge and wisdom are, or knowledge and wisdom have reached you, maybe. But on the other hand, if you say honor and glory is his reward, here as well, you should be putting a plural verb after honor and glory if you consider both as individual objects and uh, if, you, if you consider the subject phrase is plural, saying honor and glory are his reward. But, but, under some circumstances, just like breaking and entering, just like breaking and entering uh, is considered as one course of action, right? A singular thing, although you have two things connected by and. Similarly, honor and glory can also be considered like that. Can, can, be, can, can be considered as a single unit of uh, something, a single unit of something, a single, a compound noun, such as honor and glory. Maybe they go together. If you're, if you're honored, you're glorified. And if you're glorified, you're honored. So maybe honor and glory go hand in hand. Maybe, just maybe, for the sake of this particular explanation, right? So if you consider these two as one, then definitely the verb following can be singular, given you are considering this uh, subject phrase or this noun, this noun phrase as a compound noun or a singular uh, subject phrase. You follow? Okay. I hope I've been able to make enough sense. Okay. Let's read what we have here. Words or phrases that indicate portions, such as a lot of, the majority of, some, or all, must be followed by verbs that agree with the antecedent of these words and phrases. Uh, if the antecedent noun is singular, the verb must be singular. If the antecedent noun is plural, the verb must be plural. This definition may not seem very clear to you, uh, but then again, if we go forward and take a look at some examples, this definition should become easier. Take a look at these examples here. What do we have here? A lot of the pie has disappeared. A lot of the have disappeared. A third of the city is unemployed. A third of the people are unemployed. All of the pie is gone. All of the pies are gone. Some of the pie is missing. Some of the pies are missing. None of the water was fresh. None of the students have done their homework, okay? So what do we have here? You see, all these phrases, a lot of, a third of, all of, some of, none of, are these your deciding factors or do verbs agree with these phrases? No, they don't, they just don't. These are just phrases, okay? So what do verbs agree with? Verbs agree directly with the nouns here okay so just for example the first example what do you have a lot of the pie has disappeared so here you're talking about one pie but much of that one pie has disappeared meaning has been eaten already so a lot of the pie has disappeared meaning much of that one pie 
has already been eaten. But in the very next example, you have a lot of the pies have disappeared. Now you're not talking about one pie, but rather many pies, which is why the verb is also plural, right? A lot of the pies have disappeared, meaning much of the pies or a lot of the pies have already been eaten. So here, you, the verb doesn't remain, ha the, uh, the, here the verb is not singular, but plural. But in the first example, the verb is singular because we were talking about a single pie, okay? So a lot of the pie has disappeared, a lot of the pies have disappeared. Similarly, a third of the city is unemployed. So in this case, you are not talking about, uh, you're not basically, yes, you are referring to the people of the city, not the city itself, because the city itself cannot be employed. When we talk about a city, we actually refer to the people living in the city. But with the choice of the word here, with, with, with your choice of word here, you're actually referring to the people, but you're referring to them with the word city, right? So th since the word city is singular, the verb following must be singular as well. But the connotation is understood. The meaning, the underlying meaning is understood. When you say a third of the city is un unemployed, you mean a third of the people of the city are unemployed. But when you take the name people instead of city, you must follow it with a plural verb, which in this case is, which in this case would be are. So a third of the city is unemployed, but a third of the people are in, are in uh, pardon me, I'll repeat this again. A third of the city, a third of the city is unemployed, but a third of the people are unemployed. So people being plural, verb, the verb following must be plural as well, which is are. Now the word city being singular, the verb following, must be singular as well, which in this case is, is, okay? So a third of the city is unemployed, a third of the people are unemployed. All of the pie is gone, again, just like the first example, all of the pie is gone, meaning the entire pie, that one single pie uh, that was uh, baked is now gone because uh, the pie has already been eaten completely. It's, it's completely devoured, not, not a single piece of it is left. So all of the pie is gone. But if you're talking about more than one pie, not just one pie, so you say all of the pies are gone. Some of the pie is missing. Now you're not talking about all of it, but some of the pie, some of one single pie, right? One single pie, now some of that one single pie is missing. But if you were to say, if you were to refer to a number of pies, not just one single pie, but many pies, and then, you, then in, in that case you would have to say some of the pies are missing, you see? So the verbs actually agree with their corresponding subjects and they agree with their subjects number. So pi being singular, the verb is singular. Pi is being plural, the verb following must be plural as well. Okay? None of the water was fresh. <clears throat> Follow this, water is, a, uh, is an uncountable noun and therefore is always considered singular. So you say none of the water was fresh. But with the word, with the phrase none of, if you talk about people or students, then students, the word students is, of course, uh, plural. The verb following must also be plural. So you say, none of the students have done their homework. Okay? All right. I hope I'm clear. If not, please do post your uh, queries in the comment section. I'll try my best to clarify your confusions. With collective nouns such as group, jury, family, audience, population, uh, the verb might be singular or plural depending on the writer's intent. Now we talked briefly about this when we were discussing nouns, if you can remember. Now group nouns or collective nouns such as jury, family, audience, population can be considered singular and plural or plural depending on your intent, depending on your usage, how exactly you want to use it, or how exactly are you using it. Okay, so let's take a look at the examples here. All of my family has arrived, fine. And if you were to say all of my family have arrived, that would be fine as well. Now, if you mean to say all of my family has arrived, you're referring to your family, you're talking about your family as a single unit. But if you mean to say all of my family have arrived, you would mean that each member of your family has arrived, but individually, they haven't come together. But if you say all of my family has arrived, you mean all the members of your family have arrived together. They didn't come separately. They came together. If you say have arrived, you would mean 
each of the each of the members uh, or each of the family members has arrived or has come separately, not together. Okay, all right. Most of the jury is here or are here. Similarly, uh, so the same case here as well. Most of the jury is when the jury is together. Most of the jury are when the jury members are separately, individually or separately doing something. A third of the population was opposed to the bill. A third of the population was opposed to the bill or a third of the population were opposed to the bill. Same thing, although here the action is similar or the, uh, the, uh, each, of each, each member of the group is carrying out or is working toward the same action or is, is pursuing the same action, yet again, if they're doing it together then we consider them as a singular, as a single unit. But if they're doing, if, if they're doing, uh, if, if they're pursuing that particular action separately, then we may consider them as a plural subject. We consider that group down as plural. Okay, so a third of the population was opposed to the bill or a third of the population were opposed to the bill. Similarly, most of the jury is here, meaning all the jury members or most of the jury members have arrived together. Okay, or, 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 or are here together. And if you say most of the jury are here, you mean most of them or each of the members of the jury is coming in, but they haven't, but they're not doing it together. They are doing it, each is doing differently, or each is coming uh, 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 as on their own. Each is coming on their own, not together. Okay, all right. Okay, now let's read this slide here. Anyone who uses a plural verb with a collective noun must take care to be accurate and also consistent. It must not be done carelessly. The following is the sort of flawed sentence one sees and hears a lot these days. The staff is deciding how they want to vote. Here, you're treating the, the group noun staff as singular when you put the verb is, but then a pronoun is used when you want to refer to them, and this pronoun is, again, a plural pronoun. So the sentence is not in sync. It's not really fine, right? Because, uh, you see, at one time, you're referring to the to your subject as singular, uh, and the other time you're referring to that very subject as plural. So definitely there is something wrong. So careful speakers and writers would avoid assigning the singular is and the plural they to stuff in the same sentence. So how can, you, how can we rather do it? So we say, the staff are deciding how they want to vote. The staff are deciding how they want to vote, not the staff is deciding how they want to vote. We say, the staff are deciding how they want to vote. Okay. Rewriting such sentences is recommended whenever possible. The preceding sentence would rather would read even better as the staff members are deciding how they want to vote. Now, if you have trouble using such group nouns, you can actually break them, right? Such as, for example, rather, rather than saying the jury, go with, go with the jury members, rather than saying the staff, rather, uh, say the employees, make it plural for, uh, so you can use it uh, better or you, so you can actually understand it uh, better and and put your verbs accordingly okay so instead of saying the staff rather say the staff members or the employees are deciding how they want to vote or instead of saying the jury rather go with jury members or the jury members are deciding on their verdict all right okay then what we have here the word were replaces was in sentences that express a wish that express a wish or are contrary to fact Example, if Joe were here, you'd be sorry. Take a look at this. At times, we, we replace the word was, we replace the verb was with were, even if the subject is singular. And when do we, when do we exactly do so? Shouldn't Joe be followed by was, not were, given that Joe is singular? But Joe isn't actually here, so we say were, not was. The sentence demonstrates the subjunctive mood, which is used to express things that are hypothetical, wishful, imaginary, or factually contradictory. The subjunctive mood pairs singular subjects with what we usually think of as plural verbs. The subjunctive mood. Now, what is a subjunctive mood? 
or what is the subjunctive mood? The subjunctive mood is the verb form used to explore a hypothetical situation. It typically follows a wish, a demand, or a suggestion. So the subjunctive mood is basically an expression of a verb that is plural and is used when you want to express a wish, when you want to express a wish, or when you want to make a suggestion, when you want to make a demand, when you uh, make a request, you talk in the subjunctive mood. You use the, sub, uh, you use the verb that is in agreement with uh, the subjunctive mood or is considered as a verb of the subjunctive mood. So whenever you're making, whenever you're talking of something that is not just here, or if you're talking about a person who is not here, but you rather imagine what would happen if that person were here, you don't say was, but were, okay? We'll look into some of the examples. I wish it were Friday. Follow this. I wish it were Friday, not it was. Now, today is Tuesday, right? But somehow you wish today was not Friday, today was not Tuesday, but Friday. So what do you say? Do you say, I wish it was Friday? No, you say, I wish it were Friday, not was, because today is not Friday. So you're talking about something that is completely hypothetical imaginary you ex you just wish now this wish will never come true because today can never be friday friday will come when friday has to come right friday will come when it comes but for now for today today is never a friday it can never be a friday today is today which is tuesday so you say i wish it were friday to express this imaginary wish of yours you use were in place of was so you say i wish it were friday now similarly when someone makes a request or a demand or a suggestion, uh, you go with, you You employ the subjunctive mood and keep your verb in its plural form rather than its, uh, rather rather than the uh, singular form, even if, if the, the subject, the verb following, the subject, the verb following is singular, such as she requested that he do the work himself instead of he does. Follow this. She requested that he do the work himself. Don't fall for uh, the word he here because he is definitely singular. And we know singular subjects are followed by singular verbs. But in this case, we are not going to do so because this is a request, right? A request made by someone else about someone else. So you say she requested that he do the work himself instead of he does the work himself. In the first example, in the first example, a wishful statement, not a fact, is being expressed. Therefore, were, which we usually think of as a plural verb, is used with the singular it. Technically, it is the singular subject of the object clause in the subjunctive mood, it were Friday. Normally, he do would sound terrible to us. However, in the second example, where a request is being expressed, the subjunctive mood is correct. <coughs> okay. All right, we have a query here from Saladin Rana asking me if it is possible to occur or happen. Is that when, is that then we use war, sir? If it is possible, if it is impossible to occur or happen, is that when we use, yes, yes, exactly. If, 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 if we're talking about a scenario that is just impossible to take place, we go with war, such as, for example, at times when we want to explain another person, we say, if I were in your position, I would do this differently. Follow this. If I were in your position, I would do this differently. We don't say if I was in your position. Okay, we wouldn't say and we will not say, we didn't say and we will not say if I was in your position. We would rather say if I were in your position because it's never possible for me to be you or for you to be me, right? That's just not possible. It's an impossible thing. So we say if I were you, I would do it differently. If he were here, he would do it differently. So that person or this imaginary he can never be here because uh, that's just not possible for some reason. So instead of saying if he was here, we would say uh, if he were here. Okay. All right. I hope the query is cleared. And yep, this is it for today. I know today's lesson has been quite lengthy, but I hope whoever has remained until now uh, could learn a thing or two. I hope, I really hope, if I was not of much help, then I would like to apologize. However, 
thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you who have been here until now. And I hope to see all of you again, inshallah, tomorrow. And tomorrow we will be discussing the present tense faults. Okay? Inshallah. Ta'ala. So until then, everyone, please stay well and take good care of yourselves. And I hope to see all of you again tomorrow. Allah Hafiz.